Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. Colin's Curse A Bad Boy Romance Irresistible Brothers Series Extra Short Story By Michelle Love and Scarlett King Blurb Even though we were in our youth, passion cared not about our ages. I was a young adult when I first laid eyes on her. She just moved to our small town. Her family was so different from mine. Times was not in our favor. Even though everything seemed to be against us, we found love anyway. I taught her how to be what I wanted. She taught me that love would never be enough, not when your last name is Gentry. Colin she walked into my math class, head bent, eyes on the floor, her dark hair shiny and satin smooth. This is Hilda Stevens, Mr. Reinhold told the class. She's a new student whose family has moved into Carthage from Mission, in the valley. No one said a word as the girl took a seat at the back of the class. With my desk only two rows over, I could see her from the corner of my eye. Her small chest heaved with the nerves I knew coursed through her. She did not speak one word throughout that class, then the bell rang, and we all left the math room to go to lunch. I followed behind her, interested in where she'd go to eat. She headed straight to the benches and picnic tables, then took a seat on one of the benches. Opening her book bag she took out a cylinder of aluminum foil and pulled it open, revealing a flour tortilla filled with something I couldn't make out. She had large dark eyes and was slender. Something about her did it for me. I took a seat on one of the picnic tables, nearest to her. Johnny Franklin came up to take a seat too. What's up, Colin? Not much. I didn't care much for Johnny. I didn't care much for anyone. But the girl who sat all alone had my attention, nearly all of it. Johnny's blue eyes went to the girl I had mine on. Hey, who's that? She's new, huh? She was in my math class, I told him as I shoved my hand through my hair. The teacher said she came here from the valley. Oh yeah. Johnny asked, then got up and went to take a seat right next to the girl who'd been introduced as Hilda Stevens. Hi. I'm Johnny. And you are? Slowly she turned her head to look at him. Her lips quivered as she answered, I'm Hilda. So you're new, he said as I listened intently to every word they said. You a junior too. She nodded. Yes I am. Wrapping the foil back around the filled tortilla, she put it back in her bag, seemingly embarrassed to be eating it for some reason. What's that thing, he asked her as he watched her put it away. A burrito. My mother makes them for our lunches. The girl looked at the ground again. So whereabouts do you live in Carthage? Johnny asked as he got up standing in front of her. I um, my family lives on Sabine Street. Pulling her arms around her as if hugging herself, she seemed to be bracing for something. Southside, huh? Johnny looked at me, then winked. I had no idea what he'd done that for, but I soon found out. So, Hilda, what do you say about giving me your address? Her dark eyes met his, her expression confused. Why? It's pretty common for girls from that side of town to put out to guys, sometimes for money. He smiled at her. So, how much? My heart sped up, my fists bawled, and I almost said something. Almost. The girl got up and walked away, maintaining her dignity, even as Johnny erupted into laughter. He came back to sit on top of the table near me, and I said quietly, She's from a poor family then. Yeah, I'll say. Johnny laughed again. Too bad. She's kind of okay in the looks department. But you know what they say about the girls from the south side, you can play, just don't tell anyone you're playing over there. I knew the rules. I knew them very well. And I followed them, 
lest my father beat the devil out of me. One did not go against the rules my father laid out, nor that of civil society for that matter. A gentry was born to follow the rules. One never prospers if one deviates from what society expects out of them. As the owner of one of the largest ranches in Panola County, my father helped set the standards the citizens of our town lived by. Bucking the system meant bucking him. And my father definitely wasn't one to be bucked. You could ask any person who'd ever seen him break a spirited horse about that. Father spared nothing when breaking his horses. The whip, his constant companion, always seemed to be ready to knock the resistance out of anything and anyone. As the bell rang and the next class started, I saw the girl walking to my same class. This time, I took the seat right behind her. Never uttering one word to her, I breathed in her scent. Fresh linen, a hint of lemon, and utterly female, took my breath away. Why she had to be from the wrong side of town, I didn't know. No one had ever stolen my attention as much as that girl. Not that I'd ever be able to do anything about that, though. My father would skin me alive if I did so much as talk to the girl. After class, I followed her to the next one and the one after that. It seemed like we'd been put on the same schedule. I found that interesting. Maybe we had a destiny that no one could stop, not even my controlling father. Hilda I never wanted to leave Mission. My friends were there. Most of my family lived there too. But my father took us to a town where we would never fit in. As the oldest of seven children, it was my responsibility to help the others get used to our new town and home. Blanca, my one year younger sister, came up beside me after school. How was your first day, Hilda? I don't know. I walked slowly, holding my books in front of my chest. You don't know, she asked with a wrinkled brow. How do you not know how today went? Joe, our brother who was a year younger than Blanca, ran up to us. We've got to get to the junior high to make sure the others are okay. I got picked on during gym class. Who knows how their first day went? Picking up the pace, the three of us tried to hurry without looking like we needed to rush to find out if our two siblings in the junior high school were doing fine. As boys, it seemed my brothers would get the physical mistreatment. As girls, I knew we'd get the mental torture. I couldn't stop thinking about what that boy had said to me at lunch. Ricky, I called out when I saw my brother. Where's Alfonso? He was a year younger than Ricky. Our parents had their children back to back, not more than a year separated us. Ricky turned to look back, then we all saw Alfonso coming out of the building. One black eye and a swollen lower lip told us how his day had gone. Oh poor Alfonso. I went to him, taking his books out of his hands. It's okay, he said. I'll be all right. Let's get to the elementary, to get to Juan and Rosa. Thankfully, the two of them were all smiles when we got to them. It seemed the younger kids hadn't learned how to be so mean yet. Down the street we all walked past the stores, the nice homes, all the way to where the people with very little money lived. Gulping, I looked around myself in a way I hadn't before. In the doorways, I saw the young women that that boy had talked about at lunch. It seemed he hadn't been lying about things on the south side of our new town. We don't need to be outside after dark, I let my younger siblings know. You boys especially. I nudged Blanca's shoulder. Nora, sister. Blanca followed my eyes, seeing the women, barely dressed at all, leaning on the doorframes of their small shack-like homes. Oh, I see what you're saying, Hilda. The sound of a car coming up behind us, had us moving to one side of the street. Slowly it went by, the driver barely looking at me, but he did look. I recognized him from my classes. He'd been in every one of them. I didn't know his name, he seemed to be just about as quiet as me. I watched as he stopped at a house two houses down from ours. Honking the horn, had a man running out of the house like his tail was on fire. Coming, Colin. He jumped into the back of the truck, instead of inside of it. The truck moved down the street, honking again, and another man ran out to join him in the back. Before we could get inside our house, 
the truck came back and stopped next to us. Any of you boys need to make a little money? The driver, who I now knew was named Colin, called out. Joe and Ricky stopped, seemingly interested in what the boy had to offer. Alfonso ducked into the house as everyone else. Only I stayed, waiting to hear what he wanted from my brothers. My brothers approached the car as Joe said, we could use some money. What do you need done? My father owns Whisper Ranch outside of town, Colin told them. Most afternoons, he lets me pick up some people to do work around the ranch. You know, shovel shit, hose down horses, grunt work. It comes with a meal that's served at seven when the workday ends. Plus, you get paid in cash, then I drive you back home. Ricky's brow cocked. How much cash? Colin smiled, revealing perfectly straight pearly white teeth. Three bucks for each hand. So, you guys in or what? Cause I've got others that I can put to work. I just thought, with you all being new to town, you might need the break. Joe looked over his shoulder at me. Tell Dad what we're doing, Hilda. He handed his books to Ricky, who brought them to me. I stood there with their things and mine in my arms. When will you get your homework done? Joe looked at me with a smile, after he'd jumped into the back of the truck. I'll give you a nickel, if you do mine for me. Ricky jumped into the back too. Hey, me too, Hilda. Even Blanca could do it if she wants to make some money. Nodding, I turned to go inside when I heard the boy say my name, Hilda. Turning back around, I asked, yes? Tell your father that I'll have your brothers home by eight. And then he just took off. My brothers waved at me as they drove out of sight. Going into the house, I had no idea how our father would take the news. One never knew with him. If he didn't find any alcohol to drink, he might not take it well. But if he'd find some, then he might be overjoyed. One just never knew what to expect. Mother was busy making tortillas for supper. How was school, Hilda? It was school, mother. I suppose I'll get used to it. Joe and Ricky have found an after-school job. I looked down the hall when I heard my father coughing. How's father's mood this afternoon? She shook her head, then turned away. I caught the bruise on her cheek, and I knew right away that not only was he not going to take the news well, but he might take it out on me for not stopping my younger brothers as well. Colin Lying in the hayloft, the stars peeking in at me through the cracks in the roof of the old barn, I started to think of Hilda. Her long luscious dark hair hung down her back. Her dark eyes loomed in front of my face. Colin, I am here for you. Do to me as you want. Taking her chin in my hand, I pulled her lips to mine, taking them with a long soft kiss. Will you be mine, Hilda? Nodding, she wrapped her arms around me. Yes, I will be yours, Colin. I loved everything about her. Colin? I heard my father call out. Boy, where the hell are you? I quickly put on my jeans and crawled over the loft floor to hurry to my father. I'm up here, father. As I climbed down the ladder, I felt his hand on my shoulder. Why the hell did you leave your bedroom, boy? I wanted to look at the stars, I told him, trying to sound firm and not nearly as scared as I really was. When you showed my father fear, he let you know exactly why you needed to fear him. That's a pile of crap. Throwing me back, he went up the ladder. Who's up here? No one is up there, I swear it. Getting up off the dirt floor, I walked toward the barn door to leave. I just wanted to lay up there and look at the stars, is all. Not wanting to give him a chance to catch up to me and cuff my ears or thump my head, I went inside the house and straight to my bedroom. Given time, my father usually cooled off. Hilda's brothers had worked for us for a few months. Each day, I got to see her in our classes and when I picked them up after school. We hadn't said more than a few words to one another in all that time. Things had begun to get to me. I wanted to talk to her. I wanted to do a hell of a lot more than that to her. But I knew neither of us could let a soul know if we did what I wanted. Bright and early on the next morning, I got up and drove the truck to school. During the night, I'd come up with an idea. 
there was going to be an assembly at school that day. The football team was going to state, and there would be a loud celebration. One so loud that it would be nearly impossible to hear a couple of love starved teenagers going at it under the bleachers. I just had to get Hilda to agree to meet me underneath them after the festivities started. In the first period, I took the seat behind her. Writing her a note but leaving my name off of it, I asked her if she'd like to get to know me better. Slipping the note into her bag, I had to wait to see if she'd find it. In the next class, I took the seat behind her again. When she turned sideways with the note in her hand, she smiled at me. I nodded, then she did too. Somehow she'd understood that it was me who'd written the note, and so I wrote her another one, telling her to meet me under the bleachers that day. Then, I slipped it into her bag. In the next class, I couldn't sit behind her as Lisa Jenkins beat me to that place. I had to take one clear across the room. But her eyes found mine after I saw her take that note from her bag. She nodded again and I knew that our time had come. Soon Hilda would be mine. Hilda The sounds of the playing band filled the auditorium we'd all been brought into for an assembly. I didn't care about the football team going to state that year. All I cared about was the fact that Colin Gentry wanted us to get to know each other better. Not that we really knew each other at all, but I was ready to see what he meant by what he'd written to me that day. With the music loud and the students and faculty cheering like crazy, I made my discreet exit to find my way underneath the bleachers as Colin had instructed me. In the dimness, trails of light, tendrils of dust flowing through them, I saw a shadow. Colin. Hush came his southern voice. Standing perfectly still, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. K. He came to me, his hands took mine, then he pulled me back until the darkness covered us as thick as a wool blanket would have. My back against the wall, his body pressed against mine so hard, I could feel every bit of him. His hand moved behind my neck, holding me as his lips pressed against mine with a hard kiss. The way his tongue pushed at my lips until they parted startled me. When he slipped his tongue I nearly gagged, it seemed like such a gross thing to do. But then I began to like it, as he kissed me. I caught him by the wrist, trying to pull his hand away from a place I'd never been touched before. No, I hissed after wrenching my mouth away from his. He didn't even take one step back. No. Moving his hips, he made a grinding motion against me. You sure about that? I ached for him. But I wasn't that kind of girl. Yes. I couldn't believe what he was doing. Stop. I'm not doing anything, he whispered in my ear, you are. Moving my hand hard and fast, he had my body on fire, and all I knew was that I wanted to feel his hands on me instead of my own. So I pulled my hand away. Okay, you do it. Good girl. You do what I want, and you won't be sorry. I promise you that. Quivering with fear and desire. I didn't know what to do. But, I didn't want it to stop. Colin, what do you want from me? I had to know what he meant. I wanted to know if he wanted me to be his girlfriend. If he wanted us to hold hands while walking down the hallways, carry my books for me, eat lunch with me each day, that's what I yearned to know. Pressing his palm against me, he let me know what he wanted, I want this. I'd never given that to anyone and I knew I should have told him that. But he kissed me again, even harder this time. His mouth on mine. But what he did next stopped me from breathing entirely. He stepped back for only a second. His pants hit the floor, then he pushed mine down too. Pushing me back against the wall, he issued his first of what would become many orders, legs around my waist. I moved them quickly, why I didn't know but I did as he told me to. A scream began to rise in my throat. The burning and the ripping were intense. But I knew that no one could know what we were doing underneath the bleachers. Burying my face in his shoulder, I let the tears flow but the sounds remained inside. He made soft grunts and pressed his lips against my neck. Finally, the pain ebbed away. On and on he went as I held on for dear life. 
I had no idea what this meant for us. No idea if when we walked out from under those bleachers, we'd go hand in hand or what we'd do. But I knew one thing. I knew I felt a connection with him that I'd never felt with anyone. His teeth grazed along my neck as he kept up his furious pace, then growled in my ear, you know not to talk, right? I didn't know what he meant. I guess. No one can know. He pulled back, and even in the darkness I could see his face. Boyishly handsome, Colin was the epitome of what I called Texas royalty. Ranchers, bankers, and actors held those prestigious positions, in my head anyway. I wasn't sure if he meant that no one could know about the intimate moment we just had, or about something else. And I wasn't about to ask. K. It's not like I cared anyway. I didn't need anyone to know that he and I had this connection. I didn't need him to walk around holding my hand. I didn't need anyone to know anything about us. What we had wasn't meant for others to know about. Judge. I knew people would judge him if he dated a poor girl like me. How could I fault him for not wanting to deal with that? I had no idea what was going on since I'd never done that before. The only thing I knew was that he was mine. And I knew I was right when his body went soft against mine, his voice so soft, thank you Hilda Stevens. A smile pulled my lips up. Thank you Colin Gentry. He couldn't look at me as he said what he had to say next. Instead, he kept his face buried in my neck. You're my first. And you're mine too, I let him know. When he pulled his head back to look at me, I saw an odd expression on his face. I'm what? You're my first too, Colin. Damn. He let me go, pulled up his pants, then left me there. Alone. Colin. How could she have been a maiden? I kept asking myself that over and over as I drove home. Once I'd left her, I took off. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't want to see her or anyone. I'd never thought of that girl as a maiden. In my mind, she was as advanced as any of the girls on the wrong side of town. Only this girl was prettier than the rest of them. Plus she smelled better. I'd taken her innocence though. And that didn't sit well with me. Once I got home, my mother noticed me running to the bathroom. I had to shower, get our combined scent off of my body. Where are you going in such a rush? I need a shower. I got really sweaty in gym class today. I reek. I got into the shower without even waiting for the water to heat up. Lathering up I scrubbed until every bit of that smell was gone. Later I lay in my bed, staring up at the ceiling. I wanted more with Hilda, more than I could ever have. Why did things have to be so complicated? Why couldn't two people, no matter how different their places in society were, just be together if they wanted to? Even if Hilda Stevens had been living on the right side of town, her cultural combination wouldn't have changed a thing for us. Her white father, known to be a raging alcoholic who'd inherited his home in Carthage from his grandparents, had no job, no skills, and no way in hell would my father ever allow me to have a thing to do with his daughter. Her mother, rumor had it, was born in Mexico. There wasn't a chance in hell for us, and I'd gone and taken her versus card. Deep inside, I knew blowing that girl off after doing a thing like that would be wrong in so many ways. But how could I do the right thing by her when no one would allow it? I sat in silence at the dinner table that night. My father kept looking at me. So the boys took off for the big game in Dallas then, huh? Nodding. I shoved a forkful of greens into my mouth so I didn't have to say anything. Mom looked at me with a perplexed expression. If they're going to play in Dallas, Colin, why haven't you left to go watch that game? Then it hit me. Most of our small town would be gone to Dallas for that game. I can see Hilda tonight. Gulping down the food I found some hope and said, Oh, I'm going. Right after dinner, I'll leave. It'll be late when I get back. My father pulled out his wallet, then slipped me some cash. Here you go. Stay in a hotel in Dallas and just come back in the morning. I couldn't believe it. 
I had enough money to rent a room somewhere. I wouldn't go to Dallas, but I could go one town over, and I could pick up Hilda and take her with me. Thanks, Father. I'll do that. It's safer than driving that late in the night anyway. Scarfing down the rest of my food, I hurried to pack a small bag, then went out to my truck. The task of getting Hilda to come with me, without anyone knowing, wasn't an easy one. Driving to her street, I went slowly in front of her house. Her brother Joe ran out. Hey boss. You need some help today. Nah. I didn't need his help. But then, I had an idea. Mother needs someone to help her in the house. Can you ask one of your sisters if they'd like to make a couple bucks? And it's an overnight job. Mother's cleaning out the attic, and said it's going to be an all-nighter. I can bring whoever wants the job back in the morning. I'll ask Hilda and Blanca if one of them wants to take the job. But let me run it by our father first. He turned to go back inside as I waited, fingers crossed that Hilda would figure out what I was doing. If her sister came out, I had no idea what I'd do. Five minutes later, Hilda came out of the door with a small bag in her hands. She slipped into the truck, then I took off. Her lips were pressed so tightly together that they formed one thin line. I knew she had a million questions, so I let her in on things. First, I didn't know you were a maiden. Second, I wouldn't have done things the way I did. And third, I'm gonna make up for it tonight. We're going to a hotel in Beckville for the night. Slowly, she turned her head to look at me. What does this mean, Colin? It means we're kind of seeing each other, I let her know. You know we can't be seen out in public, right? Her dark eyes drooped. Yes, I know. I'm not good enough for someone of your class. Just by society's rules, Hilda. Not by mine. Moving my arm to lie over the back of the seat, I patted my hand to draw her attention. Come on over here and sit next to me. We're out of town already. Sliding over, she smiled as I put my arm around her shoulders, then kissed her cheek. Colin? Yeah? How long can we keep doing this? She looked at me with hope in her eyes. I had no intentions of letting her go. As long as we keep this a secret from everyone, we can do this for a very long time, Hilda. With a sigh, she relaxed and leaned her head on my shoulder. I like the sound of that. I thought I'd found us the happiest ending she and I could ever have. And I hoped she thought so too. The End Sneak Peek for Make Her Mine Chapter 1 Tyrell Carthage, Texas, Panola County January 1st. The limousine moved slowly, almost stoically, through the newly fallen snow that covered the road. My younger brothers and I were on our way to a new life. A life we'd never even imagined. On Christmas Day, I got a phone call from an Alan Samuels, an attorney in Carthage. My family came from Carthage, that much I knew. What I didn't know were the reasons we'd never met our grandparents. Later that day, Mr. Samuels sat in front of us in the limo looking through a folder he'd brought with him when he picked us up at the airport. A private plane had brought us to Carthage from Dallas. Being that Dallas wasn't that far from Carthage, we all wondered why the extravagant lift was necessary. The whole of the estate that includes Whisper Ranch, a 30,000-square-foot mansion, and all the vehicles, including the Cessna Citation II you came in on, belongs to you three gentlemen now. The attorney looked over his shoulder, then tapped on the dark glass that separated us from the driver. The window rolled down with a quiet swish. Davenport, we need to make a stop at Mr. Gentry's bank, please. Sure thing, sir. The driver rolled the window back up, giving us privacy once more. Mr. Samuels looked at me, probably because I was the oldest. Tyrell, what have you been told about your paternal grandparents? Not much. That was no lie. My parents rarely spoke about either set of their parents. My mother's famous quote was that if one couldn't say anything nice about a person, 
they shouldn't say anything at all. We'd assumed our grandparents weren't very good people. Jasper took over. Yeah, we stopped questioning mom and dad when we were very young. Just asking them who our grandparents were put them in a foul mood. I see. He looked out the window as we pulled into the parking lot of the Bank of Carthage. Here we are. You will become the ranch's account holders. We can transfer the remainder of your grandfather's funds into accounts each of you will open here. His eyes scanned us all. If that's okay with you. Certainly, you can open accounts elsewhere if you'd like to. Your grandparents used this bank exclusively for years. I can assure you that the president appreciates Whisper Ranch's business and does everything to keep their customers happy. Looking at my brothers who flanked me on either side of me, I shrugged. This bank seems as good as any. What do you guys think? Cash, the youngest at 22, ran his hand through his thick dark hair that hung to his shoulders in waves. Sounds fine to me. It'll be my first bank account anyway. Jasper, only a couple of years younger than me at 25, shrugged. Sounds fine with me too. All I've got in my bank is about 20 bucks. Hell, I might not even have that. I bought a bottle of Jack before getting on the plane, that might have overdrawn my account, actually. This bank will do for us, Mr. Samuels. We started getting out of the car since the driver had opened the door for us. Thanks. Your name is Davenport, right? The older man nodded. Yep. I can also drive the various tractors and trucks at the ranch. You need a ride, call me, and I'll get you there. I thought it kind of funny that the man was clearly a farmer and not a chauffeur at all. And to be called Davenport seemed on the comical side. If you don't mind me asking, what's your first name? Buddy. He smiled at me. Your grandfather liked to put on airs. We're not like that. Mind if we call you Buddy instead? He shook his head. Not at all. It would be nice, in fact. Jasper clapped the man on the back. Nice to meet you, buddy. I'm Jasper, this is Tyrell, and the feller there is Cash, the youngest of the Gentry family. None of us were kids anymore, and Cash always took offense at how Jasper teased him. Jasper, you're the littlest out of all of us, you jerk. Flexing his left bicep while threading his fingers through his dark hair, Jasper replied, by a smidgen of an inch, Cash. You're shorter. Also, by a smidgen of an inch. Cash walked ahead of us. This bank is pretty fancy. It's the best one in town, Alan said as he hurried to get in front of Cash to open the door. Here we go. Mr. Johnson is the bank president, he'll handle this for us. The president will handle all of this. That was unorthodox. How much money are we talking about? Cocking his head to one side, Alan looked confused. Are you telling me that even with the jet, the mansion, and the ranch, you still don't understand how much capital your grandfather was worth? Not a clue, Jasper said as he stepped into the bank's lobby. Whoa! Posh! As I stepped in behind him, my eyes went to the chandelier in the center of the ceiling. I haven't seen many banks with a thing like that hanging above people's heads before. This bank deals with a lot of exclusive businesses here in Carthage. He led us to the back of a large open area as all eyes inside soon fixed on us. They can afford certain luxuries other banks cannot. A lady sat at a desk inside the first office we came to. Hello, gentlemen. You must be the gentries. I reached out to shake her hand. Tyrell. Jasper nodded. Jasper. She smiled at Cash. Then you must be Cash. Yes. He shook her hand and gave his most charming smile. And you are. Sandra, the executive assistant. She let go of his hand to lead us to her boss's office. And if you gentlemen will follow me, Mr. Johnson will get things started. As she opened the door, her eyes scanned me. Judging by the blue jeans and t-shirts, you all will be greatly surprised by what you're about to inherit. I figured we'd be lucky to get a million bucks and a hefty amount of debt from the ranch. From what Dad told us before we left Dallas, our grandfather had been making more enemies than friends when Dad and Mom left town. Dad also said not to get our hopes up for what we were about to inherit, 
which might be more problems than profit. The man sitting behind the large desk smiled and got up as we came into his large office filled with furniture that looked as luxurious as it was stunning. Mounts of various game animals adorned the walls. Bryce Johnson, at your service, gentlemen. Please take seats anywhere you'd like. May I offer a cigar? They're Cuban. Or a drink, perhaps. A 30-year-old scotch would be perfect for this occasion. My brothers and I sat down on a sofa that felt a lot more like a cloud than a piece of furniture, and then I got right down to it. Okay, Bryce. We're quite certain this ranch is swimming in debt, right? And we're not even close to being ranchers. Our father's advice was to find a buyer for it and move on. Cash looked at me with narrowed eyes. I'd love a scotch, Tyrell. Let the man handle this meeting, will ya? Scotch for everyone then, the bank president told his assistant who hurried off to fetch them. Turning his attention back to us, he asked, So Alan hasn't informed you? I have. Not the exact numbers, but I've told them about everything they now own. He sighed and looked a bit put out. They don't seem to get it, Bryce. Sandra came back with a tray of crystal glasses half full of a dark liquid. Here you go, gentlemen. Enjoy. She held the tray out for us to grab a drink, and we each took one. A hell of a lot of hoopla, don't you think? I asked as I pulled the glass to my lips. You're all worth it, Sandra said, before putting the tray down on a nearby table, then taking a seat on a chair that looked spoke of affluence. Bryce picked up some documents from his desk, then handed one to each of us. I'll let the numbers speak for themselves. When I looked at the page, there were more numbers in a row than I'd ever seen before. Not sure how to say this number, I admitted. And not sure I understand what it even means. Our father told us there has to be debt the ranch has built up. Laughing, Bryce shook his head. Whisper Ranch is one of the most profitable businesses this bank deals with. What each of you are looking at is your allotted third of the money Colin Gentry had in his personal accounts. He handed one paper directly to me. This is what's in the ranch account. Again, more numbers in a row than I'd ever seen before. If I'm seeing this right, the ranch is worth millions. Bryce shook his head. You're not seeing it right. Look again. Oh, thousands. I squinted, trying to make sense of the numbers. Cash sounded out of breath as he said, Tyrell, the ranch is worth billions and we've each inherited $15 billion. That didn't sound right. Dad said there'd be more money to pay than receive. Your father was wrong, Bryce informed me. Your grandfather went from raising cattle alone to raising racehorses. You might have heard of some of his famous horses. The General's son. Old Faithful. Coy's burden. We've never followed horse racing, sir. Jasper let him know. I guess those horses are on the estate. They are. And they all are prize-winning stallions, Bryce acknowledged. Your grandfather began selling their semen and making a good penny from it. Those sales, along with the cattle and the racehorses, have made him a pretty penny. Pennies that now belong to the three of you. It hurt me to think our grandfather left his only child out of his will. Our father isn't mentioned. Alan looked at me with compassion. Look, it may be difficult to understand but let me show you in writing why that is. He pulled a paper out of the files and handed it to me. Your father signed a statement that he wanted nothing from Colin or Fiona Gentry from that date forward. He wasn't forced to sign it. Coy did it to prove a point to his parents when they refused to acknowledge his marriage to Lila Stevens. What is he talking about? Wait. What? Bryce took over. Your grandparents wanted to make the gentry name something akin to royalty around here. But your father fell in love with a female from the wrong side of the tracks. A woman whose family lived on welfare. A girl who'd once worked as a maid at the ranch house. My brothers were just as confused as I was. Why would they never tell us about that? Alan had the answer, most likely because they didn't want you to know what they walked away from. They chose love over money and over their families. Your mother's family was just as against their marriage as the gentry's were. Wow, that was all I could muster up. 
Seems our parents hid a hell of a lot from us. There's one more thing you need to know about the will, gentlemen, the attorney said. It stipulates that neither your mother nor father is ever allowed on the property. And your grandfather's money can never benefit your parents in any way. If you so much as hand your parents five dollars, the entire estate will revert to the state of Texas. Harsh, Cash muttered. Yeah, Rice agreed. Your grandfather was considered to be a harsh man. So harsh that most people think your grandmother died at the age of 45, only two years after your father left the ranch because of his hard ways. What the hell? Chapter 2 Ella Ella, get your hind end in here, girl. Mom shouted for me. Hurrying to see what she wanted, I knew today wasn't the day to screw things up. Sliding into the foyer that I'd just cleaned every nook and cranny of, she was eyeing a spot up very high on the ceiling. What's wrong, Mom? Girl, I know you can see that up there on the chandelier. Her blue eyes met mine, a tad of aggravation in them. They're coming today. For the first time ever, those boys are going to see the domicile their father declined in order to be with their mother. This place has to shine sparkle dazzle. You know what I'm saying, right? You do get it, don't you? Sure, some brats are coming to live in their rich old grandfather's mansion. And we're their servants. I rolled my eyes so hard it actually hurt. I've told you about them, Ella. Mom put her arm around my shoulders. They aren't moneyed. Well, now they are, but they weren't before inheriting Mr. Gentry's riches and this ranch. Look at it this way, they don't have to keep us if we can't make this place look as great as it can. Got me? Sure, to keep this great job, and I'm being sarcastic just in case you can't read my tone, Mom, I'll get up on that loathsome sky-high ladder and dust that damn crystal monster overhead. I hated dusting the lighting in the house. There were so many chandeliers it made my job miserable. This is a great job young lady, mom chastised me. Not many maids earn what you do. A whopping $15 an hour, mom. I didn't believe her. As the house manager, she oversaw the hiring and firing of the house staff. She employed my older sister Darlene for a few years until she went to college to become a vet. If the wages were so great, then why'd my sister quit? Most maids make minimum wage, she told me. You're making over twice that amount. You should be thankful. Looking up at the shiny crystal that hung from the ceiling, I thought the wage wasn't nearly enough for all the hazardous duty that came with keeping the place pristine. Thankful, huh? For what? For having to climb up on a ladder, then carefully wipe down each and every little crystal teardrop up there? Yep, she said matter-of-factly. And hop to it, child. The new proprietors will be here in about an hour. This room in particular needs to shine. It's the first one they see. With a huff, I strolled to the back to get the indoor ladder out of the shed. I grumbled and growled as I carried the heavy thing inside, all the way into the lobby to set it up. I don't get it. Who cares if it has a little dust on it? These guys aren't used to seeing things like this anyway. They won't even give it a second look. They'll be so overwhelmed by this place that they won't look too hard at anything. After getting one half of it cleaned up, I climbed down the ladder to move it over to reach the other half. The front door opened as I was halfway up, and I nearly lost my balance, supposing it must be the new owners. Shit. Classy Ella, my brother Kyle commented as he came in. He looked up at me with a grin. You missed a spot. He pointed at the half I was about to clean. You missed the bus. What did that mean? It came out just the same. Often I just said what came to my mind, whether it made any sense or not. Whatever that means. He passed the ladder, stopped and took a step back, putting his hands on either side of it. What if I gave this a little shake? What would you do, baby sister? Kick your butt. I held on tightly because he'd shake it and laugh as I screamed for mercy. Kick my butt? He gave it one shake. You sure about that? Shrieking I glared at him. Stop. If you make me fall, 
Mom will kill you for making a mess. And God forbid my head bust open and my brains get all over this floor, Kyle Finley. Yeah, the new owners might slip on your gore and fire us all. He laughed, then walked out of the room. Kyle worked with our father, who has been the foreman on the ranch since before any of us were even born. He and Mr. Gentry were as close to being friends as that old good-for-nothing ever got to be with anyone else. Perhaps cause dad understood the cranky old man. The door opened again, and I chastised myself for not having the job done yet. Luckily it was dad who walked inside. You better hurry the hell up, Ella. They should be here any second now. The only reason I came inside was to greet them when they arrive. And I can see up your skirt. You need to wear bigger knickers, young lady. Using one hand to dust and the other to hold my skirt closer, I muttered, I don't want to wear bigger panties. I want to stop wearing this stupid maid's uniform and wear jeans, a t-shirt, and some freaking tennis shoes. These dumb maid shoes look horrible. And I'd love it if my job never entailed, getting up on a ladder in the first place so people could see up my damn skirt. Try your best to curtail your sass, Ella. Dad gestured for me to get down. Come on, that's good enough. I know your mama thinks every little thing needs to shine to impress these men, but they won't give a lick about a little dust. And their first impression shouldn't be one where your undies are showing. I nearly had it done anyway. Dad, I'm almost finished. Mama will send me back up here to finish the job. And you dang well know she'll do it too. Well just scurry then. He left the lobby, shaking his head as he mumbled, that girl is going to be the next to go. I just know it. Like I cared if the new guys fired me. I could get another job. Most likely one with better pay. Of course, I hadn't gone to college after graduating from high school. That shouldn't be important in getting a great paying job. My parents had been asking me since my 21st birthday, a month ago, about what I'd like to do for a profession. When I told them it would be fun to be a stand-up comedian, they laughed at me. That proved I could be successful as a comic, since I'd made them laugh without even trying. However, I hadn't really meant that. I didn't know what I wanted to be. So for now, a maid was it. One day that would change, I just knew it would. And this is the ceremonial entrance to your new home, gentlemen, came a voice from behind me. Looking back, I saw that lawyer Mr. Gentry had been around the place a lot during the last year when he was sick. He was bringing the new owners through the back entrance, and they caught me with my guard down. Oh shit. Scrambling down the ladder, I skipped a rung and began a fall that was sure to leave me looking like an idiot as my body splayed out on the granite floor. Only I didn't hit the floor. Instead, a pair of strong arms caught me. Got ya. Opening my eyes which I had squeezed shut while falling, I saw his eyes first. Blue like the sky, they twinkled as he looked down at me. Put me down. I didn't ask for your help. Damn, he's attractive. Too attractive. His dark hair made those blue eyes really stand out. And talk about muscles. Whoa. I looked at the three new owners and found them all pretty damn devastating. But the one who caught me really shook me up. And I don't get shook up. Not ever. Sorry if I offended you by saving your neck. He placed my feet on the floor. Straightening out my shirt and skirt, I then ran my hand through my pony to make sure it was on point. You didn't save me. The man's eyes scanned me. I at the very least, saved you from an embarrassing fall. Some people would say thank you. I have cat-like reflexes. You'd have seen them in action had you kept your meaty paws to yourself. Going to take the ladder down, I found the man stepping in front of me, taking it down himself. I. No, I've got this. Tucking the ladder under his arm, an arm with a massive bicep bulging under the long sleeve brown tee he wore, he kept his eyes on me. I'm Tyrell. And you are? The maid. I reached out to take the ladder from him. If my mom, who's also the house manager, catches you taking that out, she'll kill me. I don't need that today. Not with you guys here. The lawyer seemed taken aback as he said, Who the hell are you? Mom and dad walked into the room both with ashen faces as my father said, That's Ella, our youngest. 
He looked at me with a grim expression. Get that ladder and work elsewhere, Ella. The man who caught me shook his head. She's much too small to be carrying this around. I'll put it up. Come on, Ella. Show me where this thing goes. And by the way, these are my brothers, Jasper and Cash. Duh. I led the way out of the room, ignoring my parents' dropped jaws. Come on. I'll show you. What did you say your name is, again? I missed it. He kind of made me all wiggly inside, including inside my brain. Tyrell, he said with a southern drawl. Tyrell Gentry. And you are Ella. Finley. My parents have run this place forever. I think my dad was your grandfather's only friend. Opening the door to the back, I pointed to the shed. It goes in there. Thanks Tyrell Gentry. For catching you. His eyes sparkled again. Damn he's too attractive for his own good. Sure. Even though I didn't need your help. Next time I'll let you fall. He kicked the door shut behind him as he walked out. And I watched him walk away through the window next to the door, my mouth watering, as well as other parts of my anatomy. End of sneak peek for Make, Her Mind by Michelle Love and Scarlet King. Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio copyright 2024 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel. It helps more than you know.